For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today is researcher and analyst Professor Raymond Sadna, here to unpack his column titled Being a Revolutionary or Pursuing an Emancipatory Path in Period of Negotiations, Part 5. So he's not stretching things a bit to link revolution and negotiations. And are negotiations not really a way of averting revolution? Well, I think people have a stereotyped view of revolution. Even the dictionaries, they emphasize violence. And revolutions need not be violent. As I said, I think it was in the first part of the series, 1994, in my view, was a revolution in the sense that it changed white South Africa into a democratic South Africa, where a number of possibilities for freedom were opened. And uh, they haven't been fully realized, but it was a revolution which is incomplete and in some ways has suffered reversals. Also, there was a situation before the negotiations where neither side could defeat the other, and the way to get forward was through negotiations. And in fact, negotiations did lead to democratic elections and a very advanced democratic constitution. And you refer to Nelson Mandela initiating talks with the apartheid regime from inside prison without any mandate. So how serious is this? Well, it's scandalous in theory, <laughs> in the sense that we, you know, we really would frown on someone just going off on their own and doing something. I would call it individualistic or uh, uncomradely, uh, not respecting the collective. But what happened is that Mandela understood that there was this deadlock that I referred to, that there was an opportunity by virtue of some of the apartheid leaders coming to speak to him, like Kirby could see, there was an opportunity to find a new way of going forward by talking to the regime with a view to negotiations. Now, when he did this, he had nothing to gain as a person. He wasn't doing this in order to get 100,000 rands in his bank account or to get one or other position. He was doing the, what he understood from his analysis was a way of going forward. And when he reported to the others, he wasn't any longer on Robin Island, was with Walter Sisulu and others. They all said to him that it was the correct thing to do. Some of them thought it was should have been done earlier. What I think they were really saying is collective leadership, consultation, cannot be absolute. There are some situations when to go forward is necessary to act without collective decision-making. And this was one, and they understood that Mandela, as I say, had nothing to gain from it. He just had the interests of the struggle in mind. A recurring theme in this part of the series is that you and the others were not informed of what was going on while you carried out the instructions of creating an insurrection, others were talking to the other side. So do you think there is something sinister in this? Well, when you get involved in talks about talks, it has to be secret. And consequently, it was not possible to make a public statement saying, we met with the Apartheid Intelligence Service in Geneva or some such thing or Mandela yesterday met with Neil Barnard at Paulsmore Prison. They couldn't make these statements. And in retrospect, it was really problematic situation in that in 1989, the Communist Party held a conference in Cuba on insurrection, and it made a new program, The Path to Power, on insurrection. And Tabo Mbeki, was chairing that meeting, and at the same time he was carrying on secret talks, so that it, it wasn't sinister, but it created a sense of resentment later, that people were busy 
doing what they were told to do, uh, risking and losing their lives in insurrection, and others were talking to the apartheid regime, and uh, they felt there was something not right about it. And I think that the way in which the transition was managed didn't help to alleviate that feeling, because almost immediately after unbanning, there were meetings and they were making concessions like uh, seizing armed action without consulting uh, the membership. And people in MK and ordinary members were confused. I didn't publicly come out against it or anything like that, but I wasn't, I was in leadership, but I wasn't consulted. And I was asked by City Press to write um, a defense of suspending armed action. And I wrote it, even though I didn't know the reasoning properly. I mean, I was not in on the discussions and it was reprinted in the ANC journal, Sechaba. So even though I myself was not part of the decision and was not happy about decision, like Chris Harney, he got people to accept it, but he was not happy about the lack of consultation. But we accepted that we had to carry out decisions of the liberation movement. And if we disagreed, had to keep it internally and debate it inside. Because now our period was opening where we could meet and meet together uh, as legal organizations. And lastly, you place a lot of weight on peace and nonviolence. And why is it that this is apparently not shared by political actors of today and indeed of much of the post-apartheid period? Well, since Chief Lutuli, I have hardly, I don't remember any ANC person except for me. Well, I've now left the ANC, but, and I, in fact, I didn't say anything about nonviolence when I was in the ANC. But I don't see much in public life in supporting nonviolence as a principle, emphasizing the importance of peace. We've got to understand that. You can't have any human rights unless there is peace. If people fear being given a club uh, by the police, there's not democracy. If the police go into township, or let's say during COVID, the state of disaster, they make people do these exercises, they shoot people in the yards. This sort of thing doesn't happen in a democratic society. And we are supposed to be a democratic society. And the trouble is that from a leadership level, you have not had sufficient induction of the public into nonviolence as a principle that must be observed, as was believed by people like Chief Lutuli. And I think it was uh, what Mandela and others came out believing in for the new for the period of negotiations and afterwards, we have to ensure that it is interred within the consciousness of the people of South Africa if we want to build our democracy. That was Professor Raymond Sadna speaking to Krima Media's polity about being a revolutionary or pursuing an emancipatory path in period of negotiations at five.